Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, it's great to be together on this day where we worship our Lord. We celebrate Him being born 2,000 years ago. Uh, it's great to be together. Whether you're here in the sanctuary, you're fighting children in the cry room, whether you're in the lounge, the shore hall, or whether you're streaming back home, it's great to have you as we worship the Lord together. Now, that passage that David read, read for us just now is an amazing text, a brilliant text about the coming of Jesus Christ. But there is a small problem that prevents us from understanding the text fully. You see, translating words from one language to another can be a very difficult affair because the meaning of a word, the meaning of a phrase can get lost in translation. Many of you know that my family and I, we went to the UK for my doctoral studies in 2017 and we stayed there for a good one and a half years before we made our first trip back to Singapore. Of course, we miss you guys a lot. You are always on our heart. I miss my mother. I miss my family. But the truth is, above all else, I miss local Singaporean food. Wow, but Tommy, ha jiong kai, mi rubus. What is better than waking up on Christmas morning and eating kuei chap? <sighs> and the thing I miss the most about local Singaporean food is local coffee. You can search for all eternity, go to all parts of the world, and you cannot get a kopi siu tai. I am not a latte, cappuccino, ice, americano kind of guy. I am a kopi siu tai kind of guy. I remember we landed December 2018. We came out of the arrival hall and we went straight to the nearest shop and bought our coffee. Trisha had a kopi si siu tai. And I had my kopi ping siu tai. We took our first sip and... Shook. <laughs> Judging from your expressions, most of you know what I'm talking about. Shook, right? First sip of coffee after a long time ago, a long time away. Shook. But what exactly does shook mean? It's a local in English word. It comes from Malay. But have you tried translating or explaining shook to your friends before? How would you explain it? It was lovely, beautiful, nice, stupendous, ethereal. All those are true, but there's more to it. Shook also has the, has the, has the meaning of relief. Ah, correct? Like, like a good back scratch. Ah, shower, cool shower on a hot day. Ah, shook. There is, also, there is also that meaning of bliss, correct? You know, after you've been away, you've been eating out this whole time and you finally your mother cooks for you. Wow. Shook. When you're growing up, it's not shook. But when you're older and you go home, shook. Now, it's very hard to translate that word into English. The meaning of the word can be lost in translation. Am I right? During the break, I was talking to Tim and Tim said there's another word that's very hard to translate. Wok he. I was telling him, actually, wok he, you can explain. Wok he is the burn smell that comes from burning the quadrant at a very high fire. Uh, there are some of these words like, you know, shook, walk, hey, it's very hard to translate. Part of the meaning can get lost in translation. And I think that's the case for two words in our text today. The original meaning of two very important words tend to get lost in translation. Now, the first word is the word, word. Look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. Whoa, what is this word? Huh? Is it a single word? A compound word? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Maybe this is the password to heaven. When you get up to the gates of St. Peter, you've got, you got to say this word. What is this word? And how come this word is God? And then this word become flesh? Whoa. This word is very powerful. What is this word? Do you know what this word is? Oh, all not going to heaven this Christmas day. Now, quite evidently, there is something lost in translation. You see, the original Greek word here is the word logos. And it translates literally as word, like one word, many words. But it can also translate as logic, order, reason. 
You see, there was a very influential Greek philosopher about 600 years before Jesus Christ called Heraclitus. He's the guy on top. And he wanted to move away from mythical explanations of the universe. You see, in any culture in the olden days, there would be some celestial cat, then cannot chase by the celestial dog, then boom, earth came about. Now, Heraclitus wants to move away from this towards a more rational explanation of the universe. There must be some intelligent design, some logic, some reason, some order. So straight away, the word logos fits the description. So Heraclitus uses this logos to describe a divine principle that created, sustains, and regulates the world. Then along comes another guy called Philo. He's the guy below. Philo came about 50, 80 years before Jesus. And Philo is a very important Jewish Greek philosopher. And what Philo does is that he takes this Greek Logos concept and ports it over into, into Jewish thought. Okay, Greeks, you have the Logos, brilliant. But it is God, it is Yahweh who creates through the Logos. Now, by the time we get to the time of Jesus, whether in Greek or Jewish thought, this idea of the Logos was very mainstream, very common. There is this force, there is this being, there is this principle that is active in creation. In fact, if you look at your Bibles, John taps on this idea. John tap chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through this Logos. Verse 4, all the Logos is the one that gives life. But... John radically turns this Logos concept on its head with verse 14. John is saying this Logos isn't just floating out there as some kind of impersonal force. This, this Logos isn't just silent in creation. No, on Christmas Day 2,000 years ago, the Logos became flesh. Praise God. And now the Logos dwells with us. The Logos reveals God's glory to us. The Logos is Jesus Christ. But why? Why did John equate the Logos to Jesus Christ? Very simple. Because of all the things that John saw Jesus do. Jesus could tell the wind and the waves to come down. Jesus could walk on water. Jesus could take five loaves, two fishes, and feed 5,000 people. Jesus could die and resurrect and tell everyone beforehand exactly how he's going to do it. This guy, this Jesus, seems to have control over nature, over life, and over death. The only idea, the only concept John had at his disposal was the Logos. So John says, hey, this Logos you guys talk about in philosophy, in, 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 in your ideology, this Logos now dwells among us. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus wields the same power as the Logos in creation. Friends, that's the meaning behind these verses that describe the significance of Christmas. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And now the Word, the word dwells among us as flesh. Amazing, right? And a bit of that meaning gets lost in translation. Brilliant, pastor. Brilliant, I hear you. But what do I do? If I accept that Jesus is the Logos, the creator and sustainer of the world, what do I do? Now, if that's you, then John tells you that you should believe in Jesus Christ. It's exactly what John tells us to do in John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. In fact, this whole idea of believing is the central theme of the gospel of John. It's the very purpose of the Gospel of John. Look at John. John writes his purpose in John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written so that you may believe in Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. But again, there is something very interesting going on here that may be lost in translation. You see, there are generally two words that are used in the Greek for the word belief. The first one is the root word pistis. Okay, and pistis just means belief or faith or trust. Pistis is a noun. Pistis is like a name, correct? Dog, I'm not dog, sorry, but dog, cat, Jeremy, David. Pistis is a name. 
Okay, and, and uh, it's a name, it's a noun, and by nature, it's passive. You can't do anything with it. You can't say, you are, uh, don't David me. Or you can't say, ah, that time I caught the student Daviding. Actually, I was looking at David in the earlier service, and I said, actually, you can. Uh. The student Daviding means the student grow the hair too long. <laughs> Two years, the one who cut. Next year, I want to look like Jesus for the Christmas play. Why are you all clapping? You want him to be Jesus for the Easter play? Hey, don't clap, eh? Scully Monday hit Jeremy, you're fired. <laughs> Somebody has to take me. But you get what I mean. David, Jeremy, dog, cat, it's a noun. You can't do that, correct? It's static, it's passive. You can only do that with a verb. A verb is an action word. Sit, stand, jump. And the Greek verb for this is pistuo. Pistuo. Pistuo is the verb form of pistis. So it means believing, trusting, having faith. It's an active word. Now to be very careful, both words are used in the Bible. But here's a very interesting thing that gets lost in translation. John never uses pistis in his gospel. Never. Not a single time. John only and exclusively uses pistuo in his gospel. In fact, if you are a nerd like me, pistuo is used 250 times in the New Testament. 98 of them are found in this one gospel. John never uses pistis. John only uses pistuo. For example, verse 12 is actually translated a bit wrongly. It shouldn't be have believed. It's wrong. The correct translation should read, but to all who received him, who are believing in his name. Continuous, present tense. Who are believing. And I think John is making a very important point that can get lost in translation. Friends, you see, if Jesus Christ is the Logos who becomes flesh on Christmas Day 2,000 years ago, if Jesus is the Son of God, then you cannot just piss this. You cannot have a passive attitude. You cannot have mere hate knowledge of Him. Okay, law, Logos, law. Noted with thanks. Point taken, my learned friend. You, you, you can't do that. If Jesus is who He says He is, then you must piss you all in Him. You must believe in Him in a very active way. We are putting our trust in Him, putting our faith in Him. We are trusting Jesus for our future. We are living our lives. We are making our decisions as Jesus Christ is the center and the foundation and the central concern for all that we do. Not just yesterday, but today, tomorrow, every day. Not just this part or that part of my life, but every part of my life given to believe, to trust, to love, and to serve. That's pissed you all in Jesus Christ. You, you, get, you get this difference that John's trying to highlight for us? As one author puts it, and I quote, For John, the difference between pistis and pissed you all is the difference between mere knowledge and a real living faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. For John, the difference between pistis and pistuo is the difference between mere knowledge and a real and living faith in Jesus Christ. It's much like this story about Charles Blondin. On the 30th of June, 1859, Charles Blondin became the first man to walk on a tight rope across the Nagara Falls. The picture on the screen is, as far as I can tell and research, an actual picture of the event. So more than 25,000 people gathered to walk him walk on the tight rope above the raging waterfall. Blondine, as usual, walked without a harness and without a safety net, so any slip would prove fatal. So Blondine began to walk, and when he reached the other side for the first time, the crowd erupted into a mighty roar. He then proceeded to walk back and forth on that tightrope many times. He did it backwards. He did it blindfolded. He even sat down midway once to have a glass of wine. Now for the grand finale, Blondine took out a huge wheelbarrow and pushed it across. The crowd cheered with great approval. Blondine turned to the crowd and asked, Do you believe that I can carry a person in this wheelbarrow across? To that, the crowd in unison shouted, Yes! Blondine then asked, Who is willing to get into the wheelbarrow? 
And suddenly the crowd went silent. No one dared to volunteer. Church, you see, that's the point that John is making. That's the difference between pistis and pistio. Pistis is the knowledge that Blondine can do it. But pistio is getting into the wheelbarrow. Pistis is the knowledge that Blondine can do it. But pistio is getting into the wheelbarrow. Church, on Christmas Day, will you get into Jesus' wheelbarrow today? Will you pissed you all today? Will you have an active and living faith in Jesus Christ today? That it is Jesus who holds the future for your families, for you. Not your boss, not your pay, not your bonus, not what your teacher says, not what your officer says, not how well liked you are, not the doctor's prognosis. Not that. Jesus holds our future. Believe in Him because this Jesus isn't some local deity. It's not some good man or a smart man because Jesus Christ is the Logos, the creator, the sustainer of the world, the Son of God. That's who you are believing in. That's who you are being asked to put your faith and your trust in today. So step into Jesus' wheelbarrow because Jesus is willing to take responsibility and get us across in life for anyone who puts their faith and their belief and their trust in Jesus Christ. As I close my sermon today, now some of us, most of us are Christians. And today is a very simple and short message to remind us to renew our faith in Jesus Christ, to really believe, be active, trust daily, continuously, not just say only. Believe and build our lives in Jesus Christ. Some of you here may not consider yourselves to be Christians, and that's well and good. But may I invite you on this day to give Jesus a try. Of all days in the year, today is a great day to believe in Jesus in a very active way. So that's a very simple message. Jesus is the Logos and we are called to believe in Him. We're going to close by singing a very simple and a very familiar song. And I like the chorus because it goes, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing with all I am. And I think that aptly and fully illustrates what we hope to live out. Will you join me in a word of prayer as we close? Christ, we thank you that when we were still far off, you came. You made that impossible journey from God to man, from Logos to flesh, from heaven to earth. And scripture tells us that anyone who takes that first step, just a simple inkling of believing, wanting to believe in you, Lord, that you come running to us. Lord, you, you, you respond to us. So today, in whatever we are, wherever we are with you, we declare we want to trust and believe in you afresh. Help us to live for you. Help us to take our eyes away from the wind and the waves. Fix our eyes on you. That in life, it's not about survival but it's about walking on water. As long as we're going to keep our eyes on you, believe and trust in you. So we love you, Lord. Help us to live our lives afresh, believing in a very active way for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.